Good day and welcome to the show. Got another good one ahead. I like to think they're all good. Some are better than others, so we got to admit that. We got uh, coming on as a guest in a little while, Sam Cooper. He's an investigative journalist. Anybody online should know that name the second they hear it. He's just been owning the foreign interference file for a couple of years. He's actually been on that file for closer to 15 years. So it's it's little wonder that uh, he has so much to share on. It's going to be great to talk to him about his latest revision on his book, and uh, his latest things that have been breaking as they come out. It's, it's going to be great chatting with him. Lots of other stuff on the go as well. So uh, I see a bunch of you already in the comments scroll. I love seeing that. Jordan Paradoxy, Don, checking in there. Mr. Stanley, use that comment scroll. That's the great part of having a live show. I don't necessarily read out every comment, as you know, but I, it can help inspire. Or I can pass those comments or questions on to guests or uh, at least... Uh, I see them and I, and I appreciate that. Just be civil with each other. You know, we can we can fight on Twitter at another time. We don't need to do it in the comments. Scroll for this show because it will go quickly. So let me get on to one of my favorite subjects to start things off. What's got me worked up? You know, one of my favorite characters from Seinfeld in the past was Newman. And, and part of it was because he hit right home on what your typical lazy entitled post he was. He really knocked it out of the park with that. And stereotypes don't come from nowhere, guys. The re reason he was, I mean, he was a fantastic actor, uh, Mr. Knight. And, uh, because it just people could smell that glimmer of truth. And in Canada, our posties are a little better. And Canada Post, as we know it right now, can't be saved. This has been actually been a reality for decades, pretty much since the fax machine came out. Even if delusional unions won't accept it and callow politicians won't deal with it. The Canada, the, this Crown Corporation lost $5 billion, no, $3 billion since 2018. And the losses are growing by the year. Home delivery by letter mail used to be their prime service. That service peaked in 2006 with 5.5 billion letters delivered. In 2023, that number of letters had dropped to 2.2 billion, and it's only going to continue to drop. Look, people don't need letters delivered to their homes anymore. Email and electronic documents have replaced letter mail, and it's only diehard romantics and great grandma Abby sending her annual Christmas checks to grandchildren who still correspond by mail. And, you know, romance is lovely and great grandmothers are fantastic, but it doesn't justify maintaining an obsolete service at a cost of billions of dollars. In an astounding act of financial illiteracy and greed, though, the Canada, Canadian Union of Postal Workers, they've served strike notice. Yeah, the unions refused and offered an 11.5% raise, and they're demanding large raises, along with protections against technology that might take their jobs. Look, unless Canada Post can somehow illegalize email and fax machines, I'm not sure how these jobs are going to be protected. It's time to call the Cup W Bluff. Let them strike. Go for it, guys. It's only going to speed the inevitable process of winding down Canada's National Postal Service anyways. The postal workers will lose what little pa political capital they had in public support anyways because, as usual, they pick Christmas and they're going to delay Grandma's Christmas checks and they're going to drive the few businesses still using antiquated postal services into modernizing their systems. Indeed, even city governments are moving to alternative communication systems in anticipation of this strike. Civil Civic bureaucracies are slow to change. And they're often supportive of unions, but they, the posties have pushed it too far. Municipal mail outs make up a large part of the dwindling mail going now, and it's going to end. They're not going to move back to Canada Post after the strike ends. The inefficiencies within Canada's bloated postal service, they're myriad. I mean, to begin with, there simply isn't enough need to have mail delivered five days a week. Most Canadians can get by with service once, maybe twice a week. Most of the mails these days is junk anyhow, and we don't need it arriving in a timely manner. And that junk mail is declining too, because businesses are moving to more efficient electronic means of promotion and marketing. All door-to-door -door home mail and, and delivery has to end. It's ridiculous that money's still being spent to have a postal carrier walk to one-third of the homes in Canada five days a week. Canada Post realized this years ago and began moving services to centralized boxes. But unfortunately, in 2016, the union cut a deal with Justin Trudeau and they halted the conversion, so a third of the country is still getting home delivery of mail. Postal carriers work short days with long pay. They even have taxis delivering them to their postal walks in some cities so they don't have to suffer the indignity of riding a bus like the commoners. Let's face it, being a postal worker is a good gig. They're highly paid, enjoy full benefits, and a generous pension for what's really a relatively unskilled job. If Canada Post was to cut two-thirds of the workforce, you can rest assured the remaining third who are employed would suddenly discover work ethics, and they'd be able to put in those 40-hour work weeks the rest of us get to enjoy. If unions truly cared about workers, what they would be negotiating for right now would be transitioning packages and job training for the postal workers who are going to be facing layoffs in the coming years. Unions rarely care about workers, however, and they know the Canada Post is speeding towards a fiscal wall. They don't care. The union heads just want to milk the company for as much in dues as they possibly can before the crash comes. 
Let the postal workers strike. Let them demonstrate to Canadians just how little we actually need them. And the environment will be ripe to restructure Canada Post and cut the service down to a tiny fraction of what it is. I mean, some remote regions still need subsidized delivery services and a trickle of letter mail service can still be provided to centralized postal stations. Private operators are already dominating the package delivery market and they'll fill the demand much more efficiently than a crown corporation ever could. Giving in to the postal union, that would be tacitly admitting that Canada Post is expecting another taxpayer bailout. They're losing billions with the current model and they'd only lose billions more if they capitulate to the unions. There's no use in continuing to keep this dying organization on life support. Like blockbuster video and home milk delivery, the service isn't required any longer. <clears throat> and we should be facilitating the natural evolution of this industry rather than trying to fight it. Either way, that's what we got me going. I'm not worried too much about them going on strike because to be honest, guys, I don't really care. You can't hold a sausage anymore. Too damn bad. All right, well, that's what's got me going to start things off today. Let's check in with our... News editor Dave Naylor, see what else is going on out there. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Hello, Corey. Hey, my sort of Dave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I going to do without my junk mail? Well, I think there's a, you can get an app and you can get all the online flyers you want coming straight to your phone so you can annoy me at the superstore lineup while you're pulling every bloody coupon in front of me when I'm just trying to buy some milk. Junk mail and bills, that's all I get. Pretty much, yes. So what's going on at your house? I see a strange video that Jane put up. <laughs> You got rat, a rat in the house? A rat. It, was a, it looks uh, massive. It's a vole. It's big. And, and that, that, that deranged, brain-damaged cat uh, that, that somehow we'd uh, acquired brings them in and leaves them alive in our house rather than taking care of mice and, and varmints and taking them out. So, uh, yeah, it was quite interesting. The cat ignored that thing, and Jane actually led it uh, like a, a pied vole piper out the door. The thing followed her. <laughs> well, I thought it was a rat, then I remembered Alberta's rat free. That's right. Then I thought maybe a baby muskrat or a baby beaver, and then uh, just maybe a, a vole. It was bigger than our average mouse. I mean, there's, yeah, I share the game cam pictures with the cougars and the deer and the bears, which are kind of interesting, but the reality of country living, too, means we, we get those bloody rodents now. And you know what they say about the same as mice. If you see one of them, you know there's another hundred. All lurking around somewhere in your basement. Well, I think they're outside. Like I said, that stupid cat brings them in. Uh, so uh, we do get some mice in the house, but I have to take care quick of them. Cor right here, Lucy. In the basement. No bigger than a broom closet, literally. And for some reason, started to smell. And we couldn't figure it out. Uh, so eventually, the smell got so bad, my dad decided to tear down the wall. And there were just dozens and dozens and dozens of dead, decaying mice Ugh. causing that stink. So I hope this doesn't happen to you in bowls. So far, nothing of this sort. But I, I'm glad to make me think of that tonight, you know, as I listen for scratching in the walls. Yeah, the I'm night. sure Jane won't sleep tonight. <laughs> Anyways, quick news update, because I'm excited about your guest. Yes. And my mom wanted me to get her, his autograph, but he's not in the studio. So. Oh, uh, our site is leading off with uh, Stephen Harper last night, got a, an award uh, for his uh, support of the state of Israel. And, of course, the usual crowd was outside uh, trying to disrupt it and cause, cause chaos. But uh, for the first time, they were a bit more subdued because a huge line of, of uh, huge police horses uh, were there. And uh, I don't think they wanted much to do with dealing with the police horses. So, oh, good. So that was good. Uh President-elect Trump's new uh, border czar, Tom Homan, uh, calls Canada an extreme, natural, extreme national security vulnerability because of our border weaknesses. Uh, so uh, we, Mark Miller, our immigration minister, was at a press conference and he was asked about the comments and his reply is up now. You're an early riser, aren't you? Yeah, typically. Yeah, was, did you see the meteor this morning? 6.30, a meteor blazed across Alberta skies, oh. visible all the way from Montana to Edmonton. Jeez, right about then, I'd have been sitting around drinking coffee, reading the news, not realizing yeah, there was no so door show. The going. video of it is up on our website for yeah. all people like you uh, who missed it. Yeah. Um, another horror story from Remembrance Day, and we've had a lot of them. Uh, this comes from a Muslim York University female pr professor by the name of Aliyah Khan. Uh, she filmed herself yelling, F you to veterans as they walked along a Toronto street. Uh, uh, just disgusting. Uh, speaking of disgusting, we have our columnist David Marsden taking a run at Mayor Gondek for her ridiculous comments on Remembrance Day and how we're all settlers. Uh, and a big uh, historic day in uh, Washington. Uh, President Trump uh, walked back into the Oval Office for the first time in, uh, in four years. And uh, uh, President Biden said, welcome back. 
and they've had a, a private meeting and a good long discussion. So, so that's what's uh, been happening this morning. That's good. I mean, I, I pointed that out online. I, I'm happy that the, as I said, this outgoing president is being more uh, uh, civilized about the transition of power than the last outgoing president was. And uh, I know it gets my viewers worked up, but I'm not a Trump fan. I, I would still vote for him as a lesser evil, but no, I don't think he's a good person. And uh, I just hope he does good things. But at least Mr. Biden's uh, cooperating for, for what he can. Yeah, he's got some interesting cabinet picks, that's for sure. Yeah, he certainly is. I know there's a lot to look forward to yet. Yep. Right on. Well, thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks for the visions of rotting mice in my walls to keep in mind tonight. You're very welcome. <laughs> I appreciate it. As our news editor, Dave Naylor. And yeah, as you could hear, there's lots breaking, lots going on all the time. We've got reporters across the West and contributors across the country. And the reason we can do that, guys, is because you've been subscribing. We don't take uh, government subsidies. We won't. And uh, it's a point of pride with us. It's very important. And make sure that we have to answer to you. And the reason we do so, though, is because you guys subscribe. So get on there, guys. $9.99 a month, $100 for a year. It supports us. It supports independence media. It's the same price you used to pay for a newspaper subscription in the past. You know, it's not, uh, not that much to deal with. And you don't have to get rid of all those newspapers afterwards either. So those of us who subscribed already, thank you very much. If you haven't yet, come on, westernstandard.news slash subscription. Hey, buy a subscription for a Christmas gift for somebody. Come on, why not? All right. Yeah. So, you know, some of the Canada Post discussion, I, I, it's, it's, look, guys, I mean, so, you know, uh, it's, you know, this, this baloney out of DKI research saying, you know, that uh, uh, because it's a crown corporation, it can't lose money. Yes, it can, actually. It's lost $3 billion and it's going deeper and deeper in debt. What does happen eventually is they, they got to get bailed out. The Canadian citizens in the end are the owners of this. And uh, when the debt, amounts to too much. You either got to shut it down or you got to tap the taxpayers to bail it out. We're backstopping this industry. Otherwise, nobody would provide them the credit to carry on with such massive losses. And it's got to be cut. I mean, it doesn't mean there's, there's zero posts. There's the hysterics from the lazy postal workers. And that's usually who we hear from on social media getting so upset because, hey, they got a good gig. They know it. They want to protect it. Well, good for you. But I don't know, I'm sick of paying for it. It's kind of like the CBC as far as that goes. Say, we wouldn't have a country without Canada Post. Oh, baloney, we wouldn't. You wouldn't have a country without the CBC. Yes, we would. In fact, we'd have a better country. And yes, we can subsidize some degree of delivery to rural areas and things like that. But let's get real. We don't need this giant, expensive, inefficient dinosaur of a crown corporation any longer. We just don't. The world has changed. The world's changed. Banks give us our bank statements online. You can do your online banking. You know, you can correspond with anybody in seconds through email. You know, your bills, the rest, you just don't need it. If you really want those things, pay for a private service. You know, Canada Post had an opportunity on the package thing, but they blew that. Their package delivery sales have dropped to, to a tiny fraction and the private market's eating it up. That's fine. Let the private market do it. That's a growth area, but we don't need a, a crown corporation to do it. So either way, that you know, don't have to believe me. Let these clowns go on strike. Go on strike for a month or two. Go for it. Because, you know, the people who, you know, used to get Canada Postal Service, when the strike comes, they're going to find other areas of service. They're going to find somebody else to fill that void. They're going to change their practices. They're going to go to more electronic billing, more electronic payments. Do you think they're going to go back to Canada Post after the strike? Not a chance. Not a chance. So, I mean, you're, you're just speeding along a progression that was supposed to happen anyways, guys. Don't listen to the union. They're not thinking about you. They're just thinking about the union. And you might want to think about finding a new job. All right, let's see what else we got. You know, speaking of hypocrisy, just one thing I want to point out before we get to our guest, look at the numbers. We, we've got uh, COP29 going on. It's the UN Climate Conference. You know, we're a bunch of well-heeled uh, politicos and environmentalists like to get together and rub shoulders and tell us all how to tighten our belts and live a little more uh, uh, frugally and save the world. Last year it was in Dubai and 85,000 of them flew out there to uh, tell us how to live. This year, only 50,000 went because it's in Azerbaijan. It's interesting. I guess the climate crisis must be going down when, uh, you know, 30% fewer of them need to go out. Or could it be that they just only like going to the shindigs when they are in places like Dubai that offer a lot of five-star accommodations and luxury living? Uh, the hypocrisy of some of these guys is, is pretty galling, but those numbers sort of tell the tale. All right, so let's get on to our guest. I've been looking forward to this investigative journalist, uh, Sam Cooper, uh, is in the, or he's not in studio, he's here remotely, but I really appreciate him taking the time to talk to us today. Hello, uh, good to see you again, and, and thank you for joining us, Mr. Cooper. Good to be here, Corey. 
So, I mean, it's hard to keep up. I, I thought I was ready to, you know, with what I was going to speak with you, but then I got the email from the Bureau and I see you've got yet another uh, breaking sort of story coming up. Can, can you kind of lay out what, what you just uh, sent out about, what, half an hour ago or so? Yeah, this breaking story indicates that uh, Commissioner Mary Jose Og of the Hogue Commission into Foreign Interference just released a ruling today, weeks after the, the phase of hearing from witnesses has closed, a pretty stunning ruling. She says that she's granting a complete anonymity to two secret protected witnesses because they have either life safety threats or threats of serious reper repercussions to their, to their lives in Canada. Uh, her ruling says that they have direct evidence regarding how Beijing's uh, United Front foreign influence arm allegedly targets Chinese Canadian political candidates and community groups. So Corey, as you know, uh, this has been the thrust of my reporting that drove the Hogue inquiry that uh, China uses uh, nefarious networks inside Canada that threaten Canadians and attempt to leverage politicians. So really it just, it, it adds concrete evidence that this judge from Quebec is saying, she's so concerned with the credible safety threats that she's gonna seal records from these two secret witnesses for 99 years. Really? Uh, that's sealing the records of their identity, but she still wants to hear the testimony, right? She wants to hear their testimony in affidavit form. And uh, I believe there could be in camera or secret interviews, but done in such a way that the public will uh, receive very sanitized, uh, anonymized uh, summaries. And so for your uh, viewers and listeners that, that are wondering, could direct witnesses uh, such as these that have evidence of what politicians may have been colluding with Beijing, will, will they be named? I don't think they'll be named in these documents, but at least it looks to me positive that uh, the commission wants to hear from people with serious evidence and serious safety concerns that need to be protected. Okay, so we, we probably won't be seeing any specific bombshells getting that tight, but as you said, it's a good trend that they even want to have this in here and they're putting the protections up for these witnesses to come forward. So it is a good indication they're taking this inquiry seriously. This has always been my uh, my view that they've they've got to some good evidence, and I believe they that they only have the the the, the tip of the iceberg. Of course, ev evident to the public, they're holding back so much information. Justin Trudeau and his cabinet have held back uh, documents that they claim are you know uh, not pointing to nefarious activity. So why are they holding them back? And so uh, I do believe this commission has been valuable. It's proven that something very deeply nefarious is happening, and yet I still think it's minimizing of what the public knows in a big way. So some information we're getting, though, I guess you could say, is coming from the, the China itself uh, with yesterday, what you broke uh, with uh, Beijing endorsed 41 of the races or candidates in them in, in the 2019 election. I mean, the evidence just keeps mounting about how heavily invested they were in that election and, and uh, you know, uh, they're, they're not hiding it even, it seems. Absolutely, Corey. To, to briefly explain the power of this document, I, as you know, I have community sources uh, from Asia throughout Canada that are so deeply concerned, much like these witnesses that will be protected by Hogue, with how they are threatening Canada and how the penetration of the CCP into Canada's democracy is far beyond what most people understand. So these sources provided to me a Chinese Communist Party record from an entity that is specifically tasked to influence uh, ethnic Chinese people wherever they live in the world, to surveil them, to mobilize them when China needs them. And this document explains how uh, Beijing was very satisfied that 41 candidates that it viewed, according to expert Charles Burton, it viewed as potentially useful were uh, nominated in the 2019 contest. And it described uh, very succinctly how China was pleased with those results, but wanted to see improvements, you know, more leveraging of these community associations into our politics. And uh, a nugget from this Chinese Communist Party document that I know your viewers will find important is it says, Little Trudeau, or the translation is Trudeau Jr., specifically went into a, the heart of a Toronto area ridings that Beijing views as important to themselves because they feel they 
would like to control the Chinese populations there. Trudeau went there seeking votes days before the 2019 election. So this piece of evidence, I believe, suggests that uh, it, it tells us why Justin Trudeau uh, was standing in the way of evidence coming out in the inquiry. The, the document indicates that Trudeau wanted to get votes and that Beijing knows uh, he wants those votes. Furthermore, it, it says that Mr. Trudeau appointing uh, the candidate from the area he visited, Minister Marrying, was seen as very, uh, you know, very notable by the Chinese Communist Party. But the key figure here is 41 candidates endorsed. It was just incredibly sophisticated, the, uh, the analysis pointing to how that was better than the past few elections, but China wants to cultivate and control, unfortunately, more political talent within the diaspora. So I, I just, you know, as things keep breaking, you know, the, the reports are going to keep coming, but I want to kind of dial things back. And I can't suggest strongly enough to our viewers to, to read your book, Willful Blindness, and, the, and the, the, the latest edition of it, because it really gives the backstory on the why, you know, the Chinese are so interested in influencing Canada. And it, it's just really astounding. You've been working on this for, for what, over 15 years now. And, uh, you know, the, the money laundering, the interest in, in uh, Lower Mainland, uh, British Columbia, perhaps, if you, could, you know, it was, it was astounding reading that, uh, just how integrated into our economy they are down there and, and seeing why they're so interested, everything from the drug trade to casinos. It, it, it read like a, a spy novel, and, uh, but it was chilling and knowing that it was real. Can, can you kind of expand a bit on that? Yeah, Corey, you're exactly right. I feel that I sort of stumbled into this story with my interest in Vancouver's inexpl inexplicable real estate prices. Everyone knew that massive amounts of money from offshore and mostly East Asia, Hong Kong, mainland China, other areas was flowing into our Vancouver's uh, uh, condo towers, but people were not curious about the nature of this mystery money. So I chased down the origins very tightly associated to uh, what is called international Chinese mafia, underground banking, casino money laundering, real estate money laundering. And I was able to start to get my handle on the scale of that money laundering activity, which is in uh, Vancouver. It's also in Calgary, Toronto. It's across Canada, I've now discovered. And this was, uh, my work was termed, uh, a professor looked at it, said, this is the Vancouver model of money laundering. So the key thing here I discovered is, not only is this money laundering from foreign nations that uh, are involved in the fentanyl trade, but there's a, a direct strategic aspect to the money laundering that is these very same uh, Chinese Communist Party political interference networks that's called the United Front that are supporting candidates that they want to see in parliament are involved with organized crime in operations to corrupt Canada's political system, to raise funds, to influence our society. And so it all rolls together. And I'll end my answer here that yes, my book, uh, Walking on the Ground Floor, doing that shoe leather reporting, I discovered really this unbelievable connection between hostile state activity and organized crime. And this is the very activity that now the US government is saying, uh, reports have come out saying that they need to tell the American people fentanyl is being strategically uh, delivered into North America by the Chinese Communist Party with connections to uh, Chinese mafias. And this is part of what they call, I know this is a shocking term, but a clandestine hybrid war tactic that China is using against North America. So my book was a for forerunner in, a, in an area now very much at the center of the US government's uh, uh, response mechanisms. Well, and I appreciate you exposing it. And, and something else you pointed out was even the Sinaloan cartels have been involved in the, you know, some of this and tied in. Uh, just today in the Western Standard Report on the BC investigators, they, they disorganized the Mexican drug cartel uh, funded group in Surrey. So, I mean, Canada is turning into quite a jumping off point. Uh, but something you mentioned in the book, too, is, as you said, you know, I guess it, it wasn't that surprising, but the CCP had opened a file. And of course, they were watching you. Are you concerned about your own safety? I mean, you're kind of, you know, ticking off some people who could be uh, people of concern. I mean, I really appreciate your work, but uh, when you have to hide the witnesses and things like that as, as, as deeply as we do to get them to come testify, uh, how are you taking care of yourself? 
Yeah, Corey, very honestly, uh, due to my work, which included testifying in Parliament when, when I was summoned uh, to, to reveal my knowledge of how China targets uh, Canadian politicians in a threatening way, I told Parliament that I had been targeted in the same way as someone that is bringing uh, critical information that hurts the Beijing regime's interest to the surface. And after testifying in Parliament, fulfilling my duty as a Canadian, an RCMP National Security Unit knocked on my door in Ottawa and said they had received a credible safety threat regarding my reporting on the People's Republic of China. So mark this, I just told you a, a breaking story today. The Hogue Commission has said they're protecting witnesses for safety reasons for these very same issues. So no one can deny this is happening. Corey, I have to be honest that uh, I have friends in law enforcement, military uh, circles in North America. I keep them apprised of the work that they see very important that I'm doing, but uh, I, I, I'm not armed. I'm, I'm out there doing this work for the interest of Canada. And uh, it's not only safety threats, but I believe very nefarious lawyers in Canada are working to, uh, you know, to, to defend the reputations of people that claim they've been wronged. Corey, they haven't been wronged. The people that are, uh, are, are suing me could be the people in, involved in attacking other Canadian politicians. So these are the types of threats I face. And on a bad day, I tell you, I wonder, you know, maybe the United States is the home of the free and brave and Canada isn't anymore. And maybe I should think about, think about a move in the future. Well said, you would have to think about that. But I mean, as, as per the title of your book, Willful Blindness, I, I mean, you, you talk about some of the, the, the buildings and agencies. And I mean, Canadian security agencies have been aware of this for a long time. Uh, it, it's only the fact that you've been pushing it out. In fact, you kind of imply they're counting on journalists and people like yourself to get this information out because Canadian laws don't really allow them to disclose these sorts of things and expose them. It, it, it's uh, Are there systematic things we could do to aid, I guess, with our agencies so they could you know, bring this more to light? Absolutely. Uh, you're right. And I'll get to that. I want to jump on a point you raised. Uh, it came up very recently. I had learned from the RCMP that uh, officers wanted senior, uh, you know, public safety bureaucrats and RCMP leaders to go after these Chinese communist police stations, which are targeting diaspora members with violence and threats and harassment. This was known by RCMP officers from after 2010, nothing happened until my report and others uh, pointed to this nefarious activity and safety risks. Same for CSIS. They knew this was going on. They were tracking it, but they weren't acting on it. So uh, yes, there's a huge gap between what police and intelligence know is happening in Canada and what they can do or what the political will allows them to do to tackle it. So I would say in terms of the measures needed, uh, of course, we have supposedly we have a new foreign interference transparency law in place. I haven't seen any names or I haven't even seen the register where these names of foreign agents are supposed to be registered. But very clearly, I've said it over and again, the United States law enforcement will protect its citizens no matter what the race, if they're Iranian, if they're Chinese, if they're from anywhere and they come to live in that country to exercise their freedoms, U.S law enforcement has the power to put away agents being hired by foreign uh, intelligence and mafias to target people. Canada needs those types of laws and we're very far away from having them. Well, and I mean, just getting a, a little more on the political end, but it's still, it still, it ties in. I mean, the, the American, there's a new administration coming in that's very protectionist, uh, speaking up a lot more on the security of their borders and, and Canada, uh, to be honest, starts to look like a security threat, like for the sake of our trade, for the sake of our Canadians and Americans traveling freely back and forth on the border. We really want to tighten this mess up because it's, it's sort of an embarrassment and it's in inspiring the states to hinder uh, travel between our countries. There's no question that's happening. And, you know, I, I have liked traveling to Mexico in the past, but I'll never go there again because I've talked to the people there. I've been to certain spots and they're run by organized crime cartels. The corruption is top to bottom. Why I raise that is that people in the United States, highly you know, knowledgeable and well-placed, start to see Canada as you know, uh, a captured. That is, our cities have a deep problem with organized crime. You just mentioned super labs in, uh, in BC, in the mountainous areas, in Alberta. 
tied to Mexican and Chinese, uh, Mexican cartels, Chinese triads using our country. Look, you're right. Uh, the U.S. administration isn't going to put up with that. There will be a new war on fentanyl cartels and Canada could be uh, come into a, a lot of scrutiny for our role in those international networks. Yeah, and that, that, that fentanyl is just doing horrific damage throughout all of North America right now. And, and uh, if we're target, pinpointed as the source of it coming into the United States, I'm, I, I can't blame them for starting to crack down on us. It's, it's a terrible outcome. Um, as these hearings, you know, before I, I, I finish, I guess, you know, they're, they're going, do you expect anything productive to come from this? Though so it just seems like they keep kicking the can down the road and kicking the can down the road, and we never actually achieve anything. You're right. One of the most credible witnesses I found, in my view, was MP Michael Chan, who uh, was targeted, as we know, along with his family by the Ministry of State Security and uh, Trudeau's administration did nothing and then had the audacity to claim in the hearings that this was normal diplomatic activity. No reasonable person believes that. Mr. Chan uh, told the Hogue Commission, even this commission itself is a form of kicking the can. We've known this uh, activity is going on for a long time. My reports exposed it and no change has happened. So I think he said uh, this is just a Canadian sort of uh, wrapping a problem in process after process and not dealing with it. So that said, I do believe the Hogue Commission is a step. There have been some significant revelations and confirmations. I still believe minimizing the problem in an extreme way uh, but it's taking a baby step, and I, it, I really do believe it's up to the Canadian voting public to make this a top three issue. And, uh, you know, that's up to people like myself and you to make people know, to let them know how important this is and how this ties into uh, housing affordability, fentanyl deaths, and other issues that they don't understand yet. Yeah, they directly impact people a lot more than they, they necessarily understand. I mean, there's a lot of people are dealing with, and I, you know, it's it's the you only want to cope with so much. But this is very important to everybody, and I, I really, really appreciate the amount of work you've done and the work you're continuing to do. So, uh, before I let you go, your your book is Willful Blindness. It's in its third uh, edition now. I guess part of the reason is just this keeps unfolding and unfolding, so you have to keep updating, which which is uh, I appreciate. And you've got the Bureau as well. Uh, so for people who want to keep up exactly with what you've been on, it, you've been so prolific. I don't know when you sleep. Uh, where can people find a, a copy of your book and uh, how can they get to subscribe to the Bureau? Yeah, so uh, just Google the Bureau.news. That's where my brand and platform uh, is up. It's on the Substack app if you're on Substack. But uh, I have my direct website home. So the Bureau.news first and foremost you're right. I'm up to over 12,000 on my email list. Uh, once that gets up over to 20, 25,000, uh, everyone in Canada will have to take this news outlet very seriously. So it's going in the right direction. Go there first and you can go to Amazon and uh, look for Willful Blindness, third edition, and that's rising up the charts again. And you're right. Uh, I think this will be the last update, the third edition, and then it's on to a new book. But uh, this book has certainly been read in capitals around the world by people that know uh, the problems facing us very well. Well, I really appreciate the work you've done and, and the work you're continuing to do. And, and of course, you're taking your time to come speak to us today. So thank you very much. Uh, be safe and, and keep it up. I hope we get to talk again sometime soon. Me too. Thanks, Corey. Great. Thank you. So again, that, that was Sam Cooper. And uh, as he said, the book is Willful Blindness. And I said, it's not a, a dry read. He actually writes it excellently. It, 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 it's a uh, you know, nice uh, style of writing that makes it a, an enjoyable read. And, and you have to check yourself now and then to realize, though, this isn't fiction. This is real things happening in Canada, That how integrated uh, the foreign operators have been in, in the economy, in uh, money laundering, and, and, and how dangerous this is to all of us as well. You know, I was talking earlier about independent media, the importance of it and keeping it rolling because yeah, government funded media, they're not going to want to shake the tree that's embarrassing Trudeau or even the next government. I mean, this has been happening prior to Trudeau. We lay a lot of this at Trudeau's feet, but uh, Mr. Cooper was working on this before Trudeau was even in power in Canada. So get on, check it out. The Bureau, subscribe. This is how he can keep operating. This is how he pays his bills. And I mean, like I said, he's got some balls. I mean, these are dangerous people. He's annoying and he's still pushing forward. Uh, you know, they're, they're giving all that protection and anonymity to those witnesses, but Sam Cooper has his own name out there. So 
you know, help support them, guys. Get on there. Uh, the Bureau on Substack. Subscribe, you know, spend a few bucks on it. It's how to keep these things going. And I mean, he has broken so much stuff. He's the go-to for the intelligence agents and the others impacted to leak information to so they can get it out there. It's uh, it's it's really, really important. I was really thrilled he, he came on to talk to us again today because his work has just been it's been making changes. It's, it's been changing things. It's, it's uh, forcing this country to deal with a problem that's been festering. And as I said, security agencies are aware of it. They know this, but they're bound in Canada. They can't release it. But the Americans, as, as, as Sam said, they will crack down on this. And this is harder on us, us as Canadians, the works. It, it's brutal. He said he won't go to Mexico anymore. And it's sad. It's a beautiful country, but it's true. Mexico, I mean, the corruption down there is unreal. I, I go down regularly. We get the teeth done down in Algodon. It's just on the other side of the Mexican border. But the interesting thing when you go down to use those dentists down there and you cross that border, of course, it's just a revolving gate to go in. There's nothing else. On the way back, it's a long line and, and heavy American border security. But you get on the other side and you see a, a compound to the right with barbed wire, light armored vehicles. And you see those vehicles blasting up and down the streets in Algodones. And these guys have, have got, uh, you know, assault rifles and fully masked faces and glasses on because... Again, they're trying to make sure the area and the business and the trade is kept safe from the local cartels because there's, there's an ongoing drug war going on down there. But it's leaking up into Canada. And uh, as we said, you know, sin, sin, the Sinaloan cartel involved in Vancouver. And that's a long ways to go. But, hey, they follow money. And now, uh, as was just broken or, you know, reported on in the standard, uh, in Surrey, yeah, another uh, drug cartel, uh, Mexican tied cartel, was, uh, there was just a big bust there. This is scary stuff. It just keeps going. Um, by the way, I, I know somebody earlier, and I can't remember which commenter it was, had mentioned, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm just going to turn the page now, uh, Azerbaijan, because that's where the, the COP29 summit is. He said Azerbaijan is a beautiful country. Anyway, that's true. I don't want to crap on Azerbaijan or any country for, for that matter. It's just that if you're one of those travelers who likes going to those shindigs, you know, those climate conferences, because that's all it is, is they stay in five heart star hotels, eat top of the line food, fly first class, things that we can't imagine. And they get their governments to pay for it and, the, and their charity organizations. But they're much more inclined to go to places like Dubai because Dubai has massive uh, facilities and, and uh, you know, because they've used virtual slave labor from India and things like that to maintain it in the Philippines. They prefer to go there. That's why 85,000 of them went to Dubai, though, versus Azerbaijan, which I'm sure, again, is a beautiful country and has some facilities, but just not quite the same resources to really uh, pamper these uh, climate travelers, uh, you know, like some of the other areas would. Uh, so let's see what else have we got. Uh, yeah, I, this came out in Blacklocks. I think it's been put out in the standard now as well. Blacklocks Reporter, another great independent outlet. Uh, Trudeau's liberals have since 2016 sent nearly $286 million to the UNRWA. Now, that's the United Nations uh, Relief and Works Agency. What it's also known as is a front for Hamas. It always has been. The, the, the money, the arms, the tunnels, all of that stuff going to Hamas. I mean, the UNRWA has been getting billions over the years from all different countries, yet somehow, oh my God, Gaza's an open-air prison. Oh, we can't feed our children. Sure, they got the money, but what do they do with it? They bought rockets. They dug tunnels. Oh, and of course, their leadership lived in luxury. Well, Canada spent $286 million, gave it to that group. And when it was found that not only that group, you know, just funds the terrorism, they are the terrorists. UNRWA workers were found to have taken part in the October 7th slaughter and rape of people at a music festival. Yeah, they directly took part in it. And we stopped funding, almost every civilized country stopped funding the UNR, you know, that group when, when they saw that. Except Canada two months later, said, yeah, we're going to start giving them money again. They've learned their lesson. Good Lord. This is what you work for, guys. This is what you pay your taxes for so they can fund terrorists. Literally. Literally. <laughs> it's just, there's, there's, there's no end to it. Canada, so, you know, so here's more news. This is stuff that makes me optimistic and, uh, yeah, has some trepidation at the same time. Uh, you know, there's a big headline. Trump names it, and this is the fun thing. I grabbed this headline from the CBC just to prompt myself so I could have something to speak of, our state broadcaster, which hopefully is on a, a, the way out as well. Trump names Elon Musk and more mega hardliners to administration. Now, the bottom line is incoming president 
appoints supporters to his administration. That's the reality of it, but not the state broadcaster in Canada. Yes, he's going to bring them in. If it had been uh, Kamala Harris, she would have brought in a bunch of her lefty supporters in there. That's the way these things work. It's called democracy. It's called politics. But bringing in Elon Musk is really interesting. It really is. Um, and he, he, what do they call it? The Department of Government Efficiency or something like that, I think. So, you know, Doge, they're kind of doing a play on the, 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 the cryptocurrency that Musk supports. But you see, bloated civil services are crushing developed nations. They really are. They're hurting our productivity. I mean, Canada is so much worse off than the Americans when it comes to this. Uh, you know, Trudeau bloated our, our bureaucrats by, what, 40% since he, since he got in. Our country hasn't grown by that much. we got 40% more government workers doing whatever the heck they do. Usually not a heck of a lot. Usually just going on strike a lot and whining about having to go into work two days a week. Now, they're costing us a fortune. Canada's productivity, our GDP per capita is crap. We're like 30000 a year less than the Americans now, and it's dropping. And part of that reason is just a whole bunch of our resources as a nation get poured into government, get poured into a bunch of pointy-headed bureaucrats who push one piece of paper from a desk to another desk if they even show up at work to go to the desks, and they make a lot of money to do so. Somebody needs the knackers to cut, cut heavily, cut deeply. Somebody who's got those kind of knackers in the States is Elon Musk. He's not afraid of shaking the tree. The Americans have the problem not as badly as us, but they still have it badly. And he's looking to go in and cut. This is the sort of thing that can inspire change in Canada. Now, think about how bad Twitter got, for example, before Musk bought it. So he bought it. He laid off 80% of the workers with Twitter. Any other company that was operating efficiently, decently, if you cut 80% of the staff out, that company is in terrible trouble. It's not going to work worth a crap. Yet they're fine. They're fine. Uh, you know, and everybody, it's funny, I've been seeing reports about that. So, I mean, that 80% of workers weren't doing a heck of a lot. <laughs> they weren't doing much at all, uh, censoring and a lot of things like that. Um, so he, he cut them out, things went fine. And I see reports, oh, look, their revenue's down, their revenue's way down. Oh, they, you know, they're in trouble. You see, because it's private, they can't find out exactly what the net revenue is or what. But yeah, the revenue's down, but their expenses are way, way down. And uh, they're still there, guys. They're still doing fine. So let's see how much he can do by cutting the civil service. Because I bet we can cut a whole whack and not feel it. But here we got Kelly, a commenter, saying, so much disinformation and everything you said. I'd love to come do our job for two weeks and see how fast you change your mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I did a flyer delivery boy stint before. It was pretty easy, actually. And to do it for the large pension and wages and 30-so uh, hours and taxi delivery that posties get to enjoy while they're at I don't think I would change my mind. And then I worked 20 years as a surveyor in the energy industry. I did heli portable jobs carrying my tripod and backpack on my back up the northern Rockies. I worked in the New Mexico desert. I worked on the Gulf of Mexico carrying my stuff. Don't worry, guys. I'm not afraid of physical labor. And I got paid well to do that. But that's because it was a skilled position. And uh, it was based on merit. So, no, don't start feeding me about how tough the job of the poor, downtrodden posty is. Hey, you get some rough days walking when it's a bit snowy. You get the odd dog get on your case, things like that. That's fine. But it's still an industry in decline, one that we don't need any longer in the, the form it's in. Face reality. Quit trying to keep this dead model alive. Change it. Streamline it. There could still be a Canada Post, but it's got to be a tiny amount. I mean, it gets back to what I'm talking about, the general civil service. You know, again, they're not civil service. They're a crown corporation, which makes a weird, blurry line. But in reality, the, the taxpayers end up storing it up. And uh, we just don't need to anymore, guys. It doesn't mean we shut down the entire Canada Post, but we could cut it down to a tiny fraction of what it is. And it's not going to bother people. It really isn't. We don't need them like we used to. It's ridiculous they're going door to door. Uh, AIMCO, we'll finish with that. Here's an area I'm kind of mixed. So that, for people outside of Alberta, that's the, the investment corporation for Alberta that uh, manages pension plans and Alberta's heritage fund and things like that. It, it's, in a, it's supposed to be an arm's length non-political group, but it seems to be always politicized. It, it, it's funny. The NDP in Alberta and everybody are talking about how horrible AIMCO was, how terrible these managers were. Oh, we can't trust the government with these pension plans and things like that. Well, apparently Premier Smith ag agreed because she fired the entire board of AIMCO and she's going to appoint new heads to it. And then all of a sudden the NDP said, what's she doing? No, and the head and then she's up and up in arms and, and being all purple and doing what he does. Oh, this is terrible. What, wait a second. I thought you said they were incompetent. Well, yeah, but we, we didn't want her to change it. Well, come on, guys. You know, talking about trying to suck and blow at the same time. But I do worry about it. I do. 
I don't want to see things like that politicized. I don't care which person is in power. It's true. We do have to keep government, like politicians' hands as far away from pension funds and things like that as humanly possible. So when Premier Smith uh, works to find out who's going to be the new board and who's going to run AIMCO, there's rumors that it might be Stephen Harper. We'll see. But let's just hope that the only goal of AIMCO ever should be maximizing returns on investments. That's it. Not developing local Alberta businesses, not subsidizing political friends, not any of those sorts of things. Just maximize returns. That's your only mandate. That's it. You start going beyond that, that's how you either mismanage it and fly it down the toilet, or you find corruption where people start using a fund like that, or the access to a fund like that to line their pockets. So I'm going to maintain cautious optimism that Premier Smith, because I, I do like a lot of what she's done, is going to improve AIMCO with the uh, replacement of the people managing it, running it on that board. But it's it can also be a recipe for disaster. So let's watch that really carefully, actually, and hope for the best. And, and, and well, I'll keep an eye on it, because if something like that starts to derail, we want to hit that sooner rather than later. It's always easy to fix those things in hindsight once you've lost billions of dollars in people's pensions, funds, better to catch the problem before it happens. Okay, that's the time I've got for today, guys. Thank you very much for uh, joining in and tuning in. By the way, I'm going to be moderating a panel at Mount Royal University, uh, the Sovereign Minds Conference. If you're interested, check it out. Look up Sovereign Minds. You can come on out there, register, come meet me and a whole bunch of other people. It's going to be a really cool event going on this Saturday. And uh, Yes, uh, that we're going to be on the pipeline a little later tonight, breaking down a few more of those issues and things are always constantly coming down the line. So thank you all for tuning in today, guys, and we will see you again this time next week and do it all again.